engaging with the political system around them. So whether it is uh, campaigns and opportunities to, to engage with your local public service commission or whatever the other utility type commission is in your local jurisdiction, or if it is looking at top line narratives and presidential election cycles, or something that has been um, a big part of you know, my time and focus uh, uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic started, Uh, looking at voter suppression and intersection of the pandemic, as well as having the CC ballot use and what this means for our communities going forward. So I think like media in general, equal human beings in this uh, experiment called democracy. And there's often like this talking down and patronizing way that information is provided instead of recognizing and understanding that people just need good information, right? Um, we just need to be vehicles, uh, uh, agree up, so to speak, to bring you the information that is uh, a valid and offering different perspectives to make the decisions that you need to make. Um, and I think oftentimes, particularly when we talk about political news, it tends to be very um, focused on only the voices of, like Tina was saying, elected officials or particular government entities, and not really providing space for other people to bring their conversations and experiences um, um, into the, the foray, right? So, um, so that's really what I see a lot. I mean, I think one good example is just the conversation around here in Georgia, well, in Georgia where I'm based, about uh, uh, absentee ballots and the, the, the so-called voter fraud increase that might be happening. In particular, Georgia is one of two states that created a ballot fraud task force um, as a result of the increased use and there was more focus and attention on that than actually some of the the limitations and issues themselves at this time where we're relying so much more heavily on um, the mail system in terms of voting or if you're able to have drop boxes where you live so i think those are some of the things that i'm seeing but also like what tamar was saying as well like recognizing that movements um exist and organizing has been going on that is related to the electoral issues that we're discussing and making sure that those people and those voices and issues are getting uh, a place in our coverage Yep, absolutely. So, so shifting into kind of the work that each of you is doing, can you talk about how um, in your own coverage areas, um, what are some of the key ways that, that you're shifting narratives um, within your coverage? I mean, Anoa, this is, you know, a huge time for electoral justice, um, unprecedented election situation. Um, you know, you have a president who's messing with the mail uh, and all the things that are going on at the local level. So, so kind of in your own reporting, what's the work that you're doing to, to shift some of the inaccurate kind of narratives um, that you've talked about taking shape? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like multiple things, right? There are inaccurate narratives or dominant narratives that just are not helpful or productive for, for um, when we're talking about Black uh, Indigenous POC communities. Um, you know, like I said, I'm in Appalachia, so other more marginalized, economically marginalized communities as well. Um, so just really helping people get a sense of purpose and, 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 and necessity of being involved in the civic uh, process. Because oftentimes, like when we see just like the horse race politics, especially if it's focused on, oh, this person's bad, or this person's bad, but this person did something else worse, and then it just goes that way. That can be really like, you know, that can really make people not want to not want to be involved. That can make people want to check out. And so I try to look at ways to one, address and talk about like issues of seriousness, such as the necessity of media to address Trump's um, to not even do the both sides, like, well, the president has made a point about delaying the election, let's discuss this. Like, literally, disinformation needs to be shut down. We saw in the 2016 election um, the, the role of disinformation, and we have not really seen the same uh, emphasis on dealing with domestic disinformation uh, and the way in which it can help to um, help people check out of the process, right? Or give people like incorrect information. So I really think that that is part of like what my value core proposition is in terms of this beat is really looking at what is the right information that people need in this moment in this time about these issues and then also what is going on 
checking in with folks to see what is happening in different areas. You know, in Tennessee, uh, organizations like around um, restoration rights for formerly incarcerated folks have actually tried to, folks who may have had out-of-state felonies whose rights were restored in another state, think that if your rights are restored someplace else, it should be an automatic, you know, thing. But unfortunately, in places like Tennessee, it's not. And so, like, really digging in and taking time to talk with people. It adds a little bit more time to the work that we're already doing in our reporting, but, like, kind of, like, just doing check-ins and seeing and getting a sense of, like, what's the pulse and what's happening outside of just like the horse race politics. I think like the best decision that we have made as an outlet, also partially because of our status as a nonprofit, it, you know, focusing on like Trump versus Biden, like, like, like touchdown stuff, like we're really getting in and digging in at these other local of these other levels of government, these other elections that are going on, as well as the organizing that's happening. I mean, we've all seen what's happened in Florida around restoration of rights. Like I mentioned, Tennessee, Alabama, um, Iowa actually was the last remaining state that had a bar for um, restoration of rights, and the governor just signed an executive order, which is great, but at the same as we saw happen previously in Kentucky. So these are the issues that I'm really looking at and thinking about, and then vote by mail, absentee ballot use, carving out those distinctions. I was really happy that we were pushed to do by our senior editor, uh, Mitchie, was uh, around Asian Americans organizing. Asian American voters are the fastest growing voting population, um, but instead of just the way the media treats us as these particular like, buckets, for candidates to try and woo, like really digging in and putting, you know, folks in the driver's seat, so to speak, to narrate for themselves how them and how they're engaging. And the last thing I'll, I'll leave y'all with is like, in those series of conversations, one of the things that struck me is this focus on how we talk to people about voting as the most important thing you can do. But unfortunately, that narrative of voting being the most important thing you can do leaves out people who cannot vote, whether they are undocumented folks, whether they are folks who are uh, formerly incarcerated who have not had their rights restored, or there are young people who our young people as young as you know 16 are showing up in some places to work the polls right local process even if they can't actually cast that ballot right the importance and value as if the, that's the only thing that people can contribute because there are many ways that people can contribute yeah absolutely and i i want to lift up the one thing that you that you mentioned which is letting people be the drivers of their own story putting them in the driver's seat uh, i know that's something that tina does um very frequently sometimes very literally you know telling stories sort of as told to just letting people speak for themselves um and that can be a way to kind of shift the way that we're understanding um different things that are happening um in these coverage areas so tina do you want to talk a little bit about the way that you uh work to shift narrative and gender justice workers rights immigration yeah um so, you know, I cover immigration, but I also try to weave immigrants into everything that I report on because we can't have these conflicting narratives publicly where like we other immigrants, but we also understand them to be like integral to our country and the way that it runs. And so I put immigrants everywhere in, in all of my reporting, especially when I'm working on gender justice and workers' rights. So that's that's one thing. It's kind of like a seamless weaving in of different communities without making a big point of what their identities are because they're just a part of the community. Um, but also, you know, going into my work at PRISM, I knew that I wanted to cover gender justice in a way that did not center cis white women because I feel like that is what gender justice reporting often is. It's cis white women's, um, you know, troubles accessing abortion or anti-abortion laws become about cis white women or gender-based violence. Like they get centered in a lot of the reporting. And I, I wanted to disrupt that very specifically because I cover things from a reproductive justice lens and I really try to centralize communities of color. And if you look at who is most impacted by things like gender-based violence, it's it's communities of color and it's women of color in particular. Um, and that's not always popular. Um, you know, I've received some pushback about the way that I cover abortion access or the way that I cover a subject like domestic violence, right? Don't focus on cis white women. So I, that's the way that I know that that narrative shift is working because it's upsetting people and it's making them uncomfortable. Um, in workers' rights is kind of newer to me in terms of coverage, but 
the way that started for me was that I was covering, I live in North Carolina and in central North Carolina in particular, it's undocumented workers in poultry processing plants who are working during COVID. Um, and in doing that reporting, I started to realize that there are a lot of tensions between unions and undocumented workers. Um, you know, so much of the way that workers' rights or labor is written about, as you said earlier, does really centralize um, white working class people and white men in particular in unions. And when I started to see those tensions play out in very real ways, um, you know, unions blaming undocumented workers for everything from driving down the prices of wages to taking American jobs. Um, and I started to realize that undocumented workers are locked out of the bargaining process often, or they're afraid to unionize because um, workplace retaliation could mean that they're deported. And so for me in reporting, it's really, really important to focus on the most vulnerable people. And so as I'm like conceptualizing of what our labor reporting will look like or what workers' rights will look like, I really wanna focus on undocumented workers and the conditions that they're facing in COVID in particular. Um, and a lot of people are reporting on poultry processing plants right now, but I really wanna delve into those particular tensions because I feel like there is a fundamental misunderstanding of workers in this country and who has what protections and how things play out for them in the workplace depending on something like immigration status. Absolutely, thank you. Tamar, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I think to Tina's point about centering those who are most vulnerable, those who are most impacted, I think that's something that I always try and do in my criminal justice coverage, um, to speaking with people who are directly impacted by the system and recognizing that that means a lot of different things. So that could be people who are formerly incarcerated, people who may be on probation or parole, people who are supporting loved ones who are inside. Um, and then I think most critically, like, actually talking to people who are inside right now. Um, and I think doubly what that does is um, recognizes like how people who are impacted by the system um, can speak most accurately to it, like they're the experts of their own experience. Um, and also like recognizing the agency they have and changing a lot of these issues. I don't think people um, often think about all the organizing that goes on inside or the fact that even a lot of grassroots organizers um, rely upon and work deeply with people who are impacted. Um, and I also think it serves to not overprivilege actors who are within the system themselves. So not only relying on police or not only relying on um, staff at the departments of correction um, and recognizing the ways in which the media can also often be used as like an extension of their PR work. Um, and I am thinking specifically about um, a piece I had done couple months after Breonna Taylor's death around early media coverage of the night of her murder and, and how it kind of solely relied on police reports um, and, and the consequence that had both on like her family like her, her parents speak about um, how much that hurt them and how that kind of just exacerbated their pain um, but it also like delayed a lot of the organizing we're seeing right now around her case so um, I think there's like multiple levels of consequences of, of kind of uh, ignoring those who are closest to the issue and, and kind of only looking at experts or sources that we're comfortable and familiar with. Yep, absolutely. Just to um, briefly, um, for those of us uh, you who are just joining us, um, we're happy to receive questions in the Q&A. We're already getting a few. Um, so please drop in any questions you have um, and we'll try to weave them in throughout and we'll also make sure to save time at the end um, to make sure people's questions get answered. Um, but I wanna pick up a thread that I'm, I'm hearing um, you know, from, from all three of you, um, which is that so much of, of this narrative shifting work comes down to your sources, who you decide to talk to, who you decide to build your story around. Um, so could you say a little more, um, and I can start with, with Tamar, um, about how you decide what sources you're going to use for a particular story, who do you consider the experts in your area, um, just to get down to nuts and bolts, because I think, you know, for practical takeaways for other journalists, especially in criminal justice, you might hear something like, well, it's really hard to talk to people who are incarcerated. You know, I can't find them. Or, you know, undocumented folks don't want to talk to me because they're concerned about their status. So how do you find the sources that you, um, that you speak to for your sources? And how do you work with them, um, you know, in a way that, that makes them feel comfortable enough to, to share their story um, in such a way that we can kind of disrupt 
um, the larger narratives that we're seeing throughout the press. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so as I mentioned, I, I try and always build my story around people who are directly impacted by the system. Um, I think one of the best avenues that I've had through identifying those folks is starting with like grassroots groups, since I mentioned before, like they are often in community with other people who are inside, like providing them direct like financial support or you know, emotional support. Um, and then a lot, also a lot of times their membership is comprised of people who are supporting people inside. Um, so that's kind of been the main way that I've connected with people. Um, uh, for one of the stories I did about uh, incarcerated activists um, and some of the organizing work that goes on inside, I actually identified that source from Twitter and then from a phone zap that was being happened on his behalf. Um, and, and that particular story was also something I had to navigate through, making sure that um, I was thoughtful in my questions, not asking anything that might compromise his safety. Um, I think when you're talking about people who are inside, um, it, there's just like a lot extra level of like sensitivity that I definitely think you have to have. And I think journalists have to be willing to work around that. Um, and uh, outside of like actual people, I think that certain like data sources has also been really useful for me. I spoke to earlier around how a lot of people within the carceral system are kind of um, purposely tight-lipped, purposely vague. Um, and I think that just looking at raw data, looking at how many officers have been acquitted in this police department, how many you know police killings have happened within this time frame, can bolster my reporting and then can kind of counteract some of the ways in which um, those system actors are kind of not working with the media very well. Um, for me, you know, when the stakes are very high for the community that you're reporting on, it takes building a lot of trust um, and ensuring that they feel safe during the entire process. And so when people are particularly vulnerable, I'll report with them differently by offering them different pr protections, essentially, that I would not give to like a politician or some official who's very media savvy and knows how all of this works. I'm often interviewing people who've never spoken to a journalist before. Um, and so you have to tread very carefully. You can't take for granted that people don't know what off the record means, you know, so sometimes I'll like check in with them and make like, this is what this means. You don't have to answer any question that I ask you. You can tell me or you can tell me things and say that they're off the record. So making sure um, that I'm always aware of like the power dynamics. What I say a lot is that I talk to people the way that I would want a journalist to talk to my dad. Um, and so that really helps me navigate tricky situations or like with particularly vulnerable people. Um, I also stay in touch with sources like indefinitely as long as they will have me. I think of my reporting as being very collaborative. So not always like reporting on a community, but reporting with a community or for a community. So if something is unfolding, I'll say, you know, I'll reach out to folks that I know in that community and I'll say, you know, what isn't being reported, what is being misreported, um, you know, what do you think would be helpful reporting for the community. So I help, you know, that helps me develop understandings of how I should gear my reporting. Um, Increasingly, I wish I would have done this when I was like a younger reporter, but I'm becoming more interested in providing like a historical grounding or context for reporting. You know, like if you cover immigration, you have to have a deep understanding of like US intervention and foreign policy and all of these things. And so I find myself reading books more, um, turning to like academics and scholars, often people who are part of that impacted community to help me develop those understandings and leads to more nuanced reporting. Um, and then I'm also very picky about like more traditional sources. So attorneys, academics, you know, policy experts. It takes me, you know, sometimes years to wrangle those people and like have them as sources because I want to ensure that they're not just parroting like talking points, you know, that they have a very nuanced understanding of what I'm reporting on and that they're going to add that nuance to my reporting. So I'm very, I'm very specific when it comes to those like official sources too. 
Um, yeah, just to add on, I, you know, Tamar and Tina definitely hit it both on the head. And I think it just really does come down to like, what's your core value proposition, right? Like, what do you value? And where do you stand like with people in communities around the board? I, I think that there is this traditional notion that journalists exist as some outside entity just watching the course of democracy happen. And I think that's actually really detrimental um, and, and, and unfortunately negatively impacts the way in which information is conveyed or whose information and whose voices are lifted up, right? Um, something I heard a, you know, a national journalist that covers voting rights say recently was that, you know, um, accused of accused the voting rights org of having an agenda or a bias or misleading voters which wasn't actually even accurate and they were just taking what the secretary of state and the county board of elections were, were saying at face value and i think to tina's point about understanding like not just the history of your beat but also the history of areas and offices that you're covering while generally we do think of secretaries of state as being like a fundamental function of upholding the voting process and by extension democracy there are secretaries of state who were notorious in their abusive behavior in terms of the ballot that's not an opinion that's not bias that's like recognizable fact when you look at the when we look at the havoc that is wreaked um nationwide by chris kobach's uh, 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 uh um, what was it? It wasn't exact match. He was, um, I lost my thought, but like, but he's a great example. Thankfully, he's been, you know, shut out in Kansas multiple times now uh, in, his, in his election, but for Senate, but like, but like the, the types of programs and policies and attitudes that are being, um, like Kemp and Kemp for 10 years or for eight years before becoming governor, absolutely. And now his predecessor, uh, uh his successor, Raffensperger, exactly my point and so i think thinking about like what is also we need to treat everyone equally instead of putting elected officials on the same on this pedestal um or governor officials on this pedestal as if somehow they are more valid because they exist in this office it's the same way just in regular life how we treat people who have certain degrees or designations or educational background better than the average working class person right like the average person on the block and we all have valuable things to contribute i think it also goes into like the fact checking you know process that you do um that if if an organization or if someone in the grassroots is saying something that might be like what sounds like really out there i mean there's a way to capture that but then also you know following back up with other sources as well like um i don't think we should ever you know this is something i've learned um i'm newer to journalism uh, i'm a lawyer by trade and an organizer at heart and so like really understanding like how to convey information that that sends the right message but that is also balanced and factually accurate is like super important and we can do that without choosing sides that negatively impact the communities we're trying to like lift up so i think having that core value like tina was saying of reporting for or organizing or reporting for reporting with communities versus just like looking at them as if you're observing folks in a menagerie is super important um in terms of like how we're dealing with sourcing Yes, absolutely. And in the midst of this sourcing conversation, I want to lift up one um, great question we've got from the Q&A, um, which comes from Kate Krause. Um, and I'd love to hear um, everyone's thoughts on this. Um, so Kate writes, one issue with meta narratives is newsroom culture. Um, white editors feel that something's being covered too much or has to be covered in a specific way, catering to white people, straight people. Um, one solution is better representation but um, within newsrooms, but do you have any suggestions for activists, um, how they can hack newsroom culture to get the coverage for their issues in a way that's not distorted by white supremacy? I'll just, yeah, go ahead, Tina. I mean, I'll say that's really complicated because I came up in like feminist media and I've had um, editors who were people of color, like one example that I'll give is that I was reporting on this man who was experiencing mistreatment in ICE custody. He wasn't being given medical care that he desperately needed. I was reporting this story. We were, you know, in fact checking and I, my editor learns that this person was in ICE custody for drug trafficking. And so the story was killed, right? Because that was like too complicated. Um, so you're going to come across this like I think later we're going to talk about it a little more, but you're going to get a lot of pushback when you try to shift narratives because people are very invested in tidy narratives, whether that's that's editors or outlets or even organizations, you know, um, 
I did this panel recently about shifting narratives with Roxana Benzadu of Migrant Roots Media, and she said, you need to push back until you get fired, um, which not everyone can do, but I thought that was um, interesting advice. But she's been fired as a comms person because she shared that, um, you know, when you're working at organizations, you're realizing that the, the messaging about immigrant communities in particular isn't coming from immigrants, and it's not intended to benefit immigrants. They're really digestible, palatable talking points that appeal to white Americans. Um, so that's not like a tidy answer, but I think you should be, you should be prepared for pushback across the board. Um, and you need to really find the outlets that are like interested in telling complicated nuanced stories that aren't rooted in white supremacy or aren't rooted in model minority nonsense. Um, so that's the best advice that, that I can give. I mean, I've worked at or I've worked for or contributed to outlets that seem very progressive, but I've come against that a lot in my work. I would also add that I think a lot of times our folks are so busy doing the work that they're not as invested in telling the story or making sure they're building the relationships to have the stories told of their work. Um, you know, a lot of grassroots organizations don't have necessarily the capacity for robust in-house communications, let alone press, you know, a, a out section of their organizational work. I do think like developing relationships to the extent possible with local reporters who may be in, the, if you're in a gym, geographically based organization, um, as well as like look and see like who are the reporters nationally that maybe are covering things in a particular way um, that seems like they maybe would be amenable to what you're covering and develop develop those press lists. Like we get press requests from folks. Some of them are like kind of out there. I'm just gonna be honest with y'all. But for the most part, I mean, I am very like encouraged and I appreciate getting press releases and other things from um, different organizations because I would have never known that, um, for example, you know, campaign legal services, I just saw an alert for my email, sent out an e-blast e just this morning about um, Trump's attacks on the United States Postal Service and the connection between voter suppression. So I think there are ways that you can engage with reporters directly also in terms of pitching stories to them because maybe they have the capacity then to, to navigate their, where their work, their, their newsroom culture differently. Um, I think also the use of op-eds, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I think also the use of op-eds where possible and getting to know what the op-ed process is and how to pitch um, could also be a useful way if there's like an important issue that's happening if you're something local or, or local organization or just even I'm going to we're a media outlet and I'm thankful that prison prison exists but the presence of social media independent media makes it extremely possible for organizations and community organizers to get their message their voice and their stories out there without having to go through um potentially harmful uh, uh, uh outlets like um you know not everyone has friendly you know journalism in their communities right uh, or, you know the blog a blog section on your website or even you know a media medium section or anything like that. Um, it, is, it is a challenge, um, but it's not, you know, insurmountable. But I do think cultivating relationships where possible, like I, you know, have had issues with the, the paper record where I live, but there are some really great people who um, I know that local organizers have been able to connect with and like get their stories to so they can get broader coverage. Um, and then same with, you know, national level. There, there are a lot of really great folks nationally who are covering issues um, that could be related to the type of stuff that you're talking about. But it's also making the case, like, because we also have to organize newsrooms, right? and reporters um, we need to be organized in terms of what's important like to people because we know what other news outlets and you know AP and Reuters and everyone else is saying is important but we need to also be engaging and there are some outlets that are using things like Harkin is an organization that has a, a community engagement type of audience engagement model that they're trying to get more newsrooms to, 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 to use. So I think also looking at these other outlets like Tina was talking about, looking at you know collaborative opportunities um, with other organizations maybe to come together around issues to get more coverage could also be helpful in creating that critical mass to get people's attention on like, hey, you should be paying attention to this. Yes, absolutely. So shifting a little bit um, into nuts and bolts and, and following up um, with this question that we got from the Q&A from Margie Christensen. Um, 
Can we talk a bit about um, each of you stories that you've worked on that have been successful in changing some of these narratives or pushing back on some of these narratives um, and talk about like best practices or tips that you have um, for journalists um, who are looking to do the same um, or organizations that maybe aren't journalists but are interested in doing kind of narrative shifting work like what are some um, concrete things you feel like people can do either as journalists, um, organizers, um, you know, based on, on your own work um, and, you know, lift up a specific story if you can to kind of give us um, a flavor of, of how this works day to day. Um, Tamar, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I think in thinking about a story, a particular story that helped to challenge one of these narratives um, towards the beginning of the pandemic, I did two series, a small series of stories. One about community bond funds and bail funds that were kind of like working around the clock to um, get as many people out of local jails as they could, understanding like the vulnerability of people who were detained to COVID-19. Um, and through the reporting process, I kind of learned more about how even like conditions of pretrial release also made people really vulnerable to the virus um, and how there was kind of like an offshoot of organizing around that particular issue, particularly in Chicago. Um, and I think that that story worked towards like two narratives. One around the idea that jails like provide public safety or that they protect society. Um, and the second being that um, only people who are in correctional confinement are impacted by the carceral system, right? And so um, I think for people, other organizations or specifically journalists who are interested in kind of subverting these narratives, I think it's important to like have them in mind during the reporting process and be open to the ways in which um, that research, that interview, that, that conversation that you're having with people on the ground can um, be really generative and, and, and you can learn more about different issues and different problems that um, aren't even being misreported, but aren't being reported at all. Um, yeah, I think that is probably the clearest example of something that kind of multiple narratives are kind of working together to create this idea of the, the system as being a purveyor of not just justice, but safety. Yeah, absolutely. Tina. I think if you focus on the resilience of the communities you cover, you will always disrupt narratives. Um, if you look at how so much is covered, like people are the victims of the Trump administration, um, or how much reporting is just like this consumption of people's trauma and pain. But if you focus on the way that communities fight back, that, that it's like the surest way to ensure that you're disrupting narratives and to uplift communities in a way that they rarely get to get uplifted. Um, I keep going back to this poultry processing plant reporting that I did in North Carolina. That was really informative for me. I remember I was speaking to um, like an elderly undocumented woman who'd been let go from her job, fired after getting COVID at this poultry processing plant where she wasn't being given proper PPE. And I offered her like I always did to use a pseudonym because I didn't want any harm to come. And she said, you know, why am I gonna use a fake name? Like, I'm not, I'm not lying, I'm telling the truth. Like, what is there to hide? I still offer people the ability to use a pseudonym, but that was um, a really important moment for me in realizing like, this is a way that people are fighting back, right? They're speaking out. Um, they're using their real names sometimes, or if they're not, they're, they're sharing information and stories with me that could really do them harm. Um, so you have to navigate that very carefully, but it, it's also a way to focus on their resilience and, and the way that they are moving in their communities, despite all of these really god awful conditions, whether it's COVID and immigration enforcement, all of these things. Um, but there's still really beautiful mutual aid happening and organizing happening. It might not look the way that we think it does, but it is happening. And so for me, covering those stories um, are the best way to disrupt narratives and, and they're the most like personally meaningful reporting that you can work on. Go ahead, Anoa. I was going to add um, just, I think also the centering of, you know, folk really like having that value proposition committed towards like helping organizations and communities get their voices and stories out there is part of um, 
disrupting narratives. So like particularly like thinking about like what was happening here in Georgia, what's what's still happening in Georgia around um, voter suppression, um, um, absentee ballot use, and the attention and focus on the false narrative of um, you know absentee ballot fraud and, and ballot fraud and voter fraud generally, and how um, organizations came together, um, Cliff Albright from Black Voters, but they had formed like this coalition of task force, and um, they formalized the work they already do call important because then people see, oh, there are ways that people are moving in, in concert to address these systemic issues, because I don't think we'll ever be able to completely eradicate particular narratives so long as we do not control, you know, the dominant means of production, but I do think that we can absolutely interject new conversations, new ways of thinking, and new narratives um, into, like, you know, the overall lexicon um, and, and, and news coverage as a whole and providing people with an alternative. Like, we're bringing in, you know, new readers and audiences and supporters, like, all the time with our outlet and other similarly situated outlets. And I think that collective work is what is also disrupting, you know, several of these harmful narratives. Um, um, even as we recognize there is no one politics and who gets to have a voice and say in politics. Yes. So we've got about five minutes left. Um, so I want to encourage people to continue um, putting questions in the Q&A um, and we'll be happy to, to take time to answer those as they come in. Um, but, but one piece of this I wanted to bring in um, just with kind of recent breaking news. Um, I'm curious how you all see um, you're all reporters, but how do you see the, the role of the opinion page, the op-ed page, in, in shifting narrative? Um, I'm sure folks have seen, you know, Newsweek put out this uh, awful uh, opinion column yesterday, um, basically birtherism 2.0 um, in response to uh, the nomination, or not nomination, uh, Joe Biden naming Kamala Harris as, as his, his pick for VP. Um, questioning whether or not she's eligible to be um, vice president or president. Um, and this isn't the first time we've seen something like this. Um, on an op-ed page, you know, in the New York Times a couple of months ago, you had Tom Cotton's op-ed send in the troops in response to the Black Lives Matter uprising. So um, just shifting briefly away from, from reporting, I'm curious how you all see um, opinion writing um, fitting into the narrative shifting process. And whoever wants to jump in can just go ahead. I think um, it's a very uncomfortable fact that the Trump administration has been very good for mainstream journalism in terms of who is watching and the headlines and the clickbait and all of that. Um, it's deeply uncomfortable, but it is what it is. And so I think when you see op-eds from people like Tom Cotton calling for them to call in the troops, it's an example of that. I mean, that created a lot of buzz and it got a lot of clicks and a lot of reads. Um, and I see that as deeply harmful, but I also see like the power in the op-ed. If you could get, you know, at Prism Work doing some of this work where it could be a, a tool for the community, you know, if impacted people, if people in the community um, can work with journalists to learn how to write an op-ed or to learn how to pitch things, it could be really transformative. And so I see, I see the bad and the good in, in the op-ed, but too many people write them that should not. <laughs> or get, they get published and they really don't need to be published. Yeah, I mean, jumping in, and I think Ashley might have made this point in one of our conversations previously, like there is, or maybe you tweeted this earlier, there's a, there seems to be a difference in how people certain out there the same level of just editorial journalists did like I as a black woman could never write an op-ed like Tom Cotton and have it accepted right like um I mean I as just a non-US senator could never write an op-ed like that and have it accepted but at the same time you know I agree with what Tina is saying right so there's both there's a power imbalance I think particularly in the larger legacy journalist outlets on whose voices gets put in these places. I do think that there are some folks in the op-ed space who are trying to level the playing field and bring in more voices. Um, we do see um, flipping, on her, flipping on her name at the 
scenario at times we do see that happening somewhat um but it's not nearly enough so i do think we do have allies in these rooms who are pushing back and trying to bring in some voices in the op-ed process um but at the same time, there's overwhelmingly between op-eds and column space. Who gets to have a column and who gets to have their voices, you know, blasted out every Sunday or whenever that regular column goes out is extremely powerful and it's unchecked and it's often treated as um, if you say anything or you or you want to have some more balance or, or you know value or integrity, the process then you're canceling them or you're somehow oppressing their voice when they come from really um, you know powerful positions. I mean, op-eds are a tool, right? It just depends on who has access to them. So leveraged by community folks, leveraged by people who have the opportunity or position, um, you know, next to issues of maternal mortality or the, the making case for, you know, if you're a proponent of Medicare for all and talking from your personal experience, I mean, interwoven with facts. I mean, I think this is such a powerful conversation and, and tool. It's something as an organizer that I often encourage, you know, folks that they needed to like kind of get comfortable doing more of as, you know, black and other folks of color. We can't leave it to a predominantly white industry and space to tell our stories, right? I mean, and not saying that because someone is like, they can't effectively do a good job but sometimes like it's the same thing as being someone who doesn't speak spanish very well trying to narrate and engage in conversations with folks in another language whether it's spanish or another language right like 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 there there are just some things that are best told in the voice of the person who is experiencing it and so i think the more we're able to see um you know people i i saw an op-ed a couple weeks back about um, universal suffrage, um, universal suffrage, and it was from, you know, two women who have organized, uh, formerly incarcerated women themselves, who have organized around um, restoration of rights and tying that to the concept of universal suffrage and how, you know, the legacy of the 19th Amendment is still not completed and fulfilled. So, like, there are some really interesting and engaging ideas, beds, um, but that we, we aren't seeing unless we have people and decision makers who value making the more equitable process. Yes, absolutely. I um, want to be mindful of time. Um, so I do want to take um, a chance. This is a great question for us to end on. So just brief answers to this one. Um, but Christian Perez asks, um, how can we be supportive or how can people outside of newsrooms be supportive of reporters who are trying to challenge these meta narratives? Um, you know, thinking of the ones um, who are doing Black Lives Matter coverage um, and being reassigned because of supposed bias. Um, you know, what's a way for people who are outside of, of the industry, outside of newsrooms to support this kind of work? Um, whoever wants to jump in on that can and just brief answers because I don't want us to get, get kicked off in the middle. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, super brief answer. I think just like utilizing social media as a space to amplify their work. Um, and also works towards your last question about, you know, how even harmful narratives like social media can be a, a space for tempering that or counteracting that. I think in the same way, reporters who are covering on issues that you care about or doing things that um, you recognize can be risky for them. Um, just, yeah, amplifying their work, saying their names and speaking out about you know, what you enjoy about their coverage is really important. I also think that we get eclipsed by very big outlets. And this is a way, you know, I think people are navigating this fine line where if they recognize something that's going on in their community that needs to be reported on, the impulse is to go to a very big outlet where the reporting will get the most eyes, but you won't be treated the same way and the same steps won't be taken to keep people safe. So I'll also say, you know, consider going to reporters at smaller outlets, reporters that you trust to give potentially big stories to, because you know that they'll keep people safe, you know that they'll report on it humanely. Um, you know, it might not be on like MSNBC, but those reporters will get it right. And I think at the end of the day, like if it's solid reporting and it gets it right, it'll get circulated. Yeah, following up from that, I think um, in the reporting, if it's done right, even at a smaller outlet, um, that outlet 
that's reporting, that reporter who's done that story, their framing and the way that they're shaping the narrative can get picked up by other places. So if you go to the right person first, um, the story may very well still make it to the national media, but it will make it there in a way where the narrative has been shaped up front by somebody who deeply understands and feels accountable to you and to your own community. So, so really thinking about the outlets that you decide to take your stories to and the specific reporters you decide to take your stories to, um, I think that that matters and that's that's one way to kind of support this sort of work. Um, so we are going to wrap up. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists for being here. Tina, Tamar, Anoa, thank you so much for coming and sharing your wisdom about how you do this really, really important work. Um, again, this is the editorial team, um, three members of the editorial team from, from PRISM. Um, and if you would like to know more about us, more about our work, you can visit our website, uh, www.ourprism.org, and you can follow us on social media at PRISM Reports. All right. Thank you everyone for coming. Have a great day. Thank you.